morning, everyone. So good to see all of you this morning as we come to the house of God. And today we're going to continue with the series that we started a couple of weeks ago. And so we're going to continue with the I Am series. And uh, two weeks ago, I was sharing with you from the topic of uh, Jesus, the light. And so I was sharing with, the, with you guys that Jesus Christ, he came unto earth and he came and he is the light. And we were learning different things through uh, what I was sharing as Jesus the light. Number one, that Jesus comes to guide and he comes to show us the way. We also learned that the light comes as well to expose, but not out of condemnation, but out of love for your own good. And thirdly, we learned as well that Jesus, as he comes, as the light comes into our lives, then he empowers us to become that light into the world. And so today I want to continue with this I Am series. And I want to share with you today from the topic of um, I Am the Door. And so I want to share from this fourth um, uh, statement that Jesus said about himself. I am the door. And I want to start by sharing with you a scripture. And we're going to be looking into John chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. And it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who's, who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it to abundantly. Why don't we pray? Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're in this place this morning. As we gather and as we exalt your name and as well as we hear your word, we pray that your word will bear fruit in our hearts. We thank you, Father, that we can come together and worship you and exalt you. We thank you for today and as well as we leave this place, that our lives will be transformed and we will be this place. We will leave this place in courage. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. You see, I want to share with you from the topic of I am the door. And doors are very important. Doors are important. I don't know if there's anyone here who gets easily distracted or maybe that your husband gets easily distracted. Don't raise your hand. But I can tell you I am a person that gets a little bit easily distracted. And so some of us, it could be that we're not multitaskers. And this is true more for men than for women usually. And there has been some occasions when, like, I go, for example, to buy a coffee to Family Mart. And I go to Family Mart, and then I pay for my coffee. And what happens is, after I pay, I leave Family Mart. And I'm almost getting back into my office to the second floor when I realize I forgot the coffee at the Family Mart. So I have to rush back to go get my coffee. For some, it could be that maybe it has happened to you that you get into an elevator and after you're getting into the elevator, a couple of minutes after you are in the elevator, you realize that you haven't reached the floor, only to find out that you forgot to press the button. There was an occasion that I, like, I went, I fly back to Guatemala 
And after I arrived, I got off from the airplane. And I remembered that I needed to use the bathroom. So I wanted to use the bathroom. And after a long haul, you see, after a long trip, usually you're tired. I was very tired, exhausted, exhaust, exhausted, and also I seemed to be a little like a zombie in a way. So after I got from the, get off from the airplane, I wanted to go use the bathroom. So I quickly, after I got off from the airplane, started walking to go use the bathroom. But at the same time, I was texting and doing other things, and I wanted to get, you know, go use the bathroom. So I get there. And I go in only to realize when I look up that I'm in the woman's bathroom. <laughs> then I'm looking at a bunch of women there and they're looking at me and I'm like, oh my God. Like they're probably either thinking that I'm a creep or that I maybe I'm the janitor, right? Or something like that. So I just got out, you know, from there. I got out from there because it was very embarrassing for me. Like the women were all, you know, like laughing at me. And so, you see, doors are very important because, yes, doors mark the entry point into an area. Doors actually mark an entry point into an area that could be beneficial for you or not. And in airports, bathrooms, usually there's no doors, right? And because I wasn't paying attention, I just went in without really realizing. And so doors are very important as they mark a point, you know, into a new area. And obviously I went into the wrong place. But there has been some occasions when it doesn't matter if there is a door or not because I still went in without realizing because I was distracted, but I learned my lessons. So, you know, it hasn't happened again, but doors are important. And understanding this concept of a door is important because sometimes what happens is that it's so common for us that we forget they're there. And a person was saying that a person, I mean, that people go through an average of 50 doors a day or even more. And so doors are not are important. They are not only physical, but as well, doors are spiritual. When we look at the scripture, we see that this word doors shows over 400 times. When we see the word door in the scripture is usually to describe when we make decisions, is usually to describe choices that we make in life. And the reality is that our life will be the result of the doors you choose to go through or the doors that you walk past. And if for some reason we choose to open or go through a door that we shouldn't, what ends up happening is that we get sidetracked. What ends up happening is that we lost, lose our time. Because what happens is that we have to retract our life to get back our life in, in order, in the right place. And there is an interesting term in psychology called, um, it's an interesting term that is actually called um, the revolving door syndrome. And they said that this uh, revolving door syndrome, what happens is that if a person I mean, it could be that a person is going through challenges and struggles. But this person could be improving and getting better and working on. But it says that after some time, they go back to those like negative activities or negative behaviors. Even though these negative activities or behaviors have a negative impact on their lives. And so psychology says and suggests if you don't get help, proper help to like overcome this, like it can take you sometimes like either months or years to overcome this. And it could be that today you might say, Rudy, this is like, this is me. For some reason, it seems like I'm like behind bars, sometimes behind some bars behind, like not a physical prison, but a spiritual prison or maybe an emotional prison. Maybe you could say, maybe you say, well, it seems to me that sometimes my mind plays me a game and I'm going like around and around in circles. It could be that for some of us, it is, you know, a challenge in the area of our relationships. It could be that for some of us, maybe we are having a challenge in our relationships and one day our relationship is good and the next day our relationship is toxic. And maybe you shouldn't be in that relationship. Or maybe for some others, it could be that we have a challenge in like just with debt. 
because we have a struggle, a struggle with compulsive, um, compulsive uh, buying, with compulsive uh, spending. And we can stop spending and buying things. And we barely are able to pay our minimum in our credit card bill when we're getting the next credit card bill. And so some of us, we might have challenges in these areas. And there's different things that can hold you or get you stuck in a revolving door. But the truth is and the good news is that there is a door that is greater than anything else. And his name is Jesus Christ. His door offers so you know, this freedom that we, that we need. And so the good news is that any door, you see, there's always two sides to a door. There is the entry point and there's the exit as well. And so if there's anything that is holding you back from fulfilling, I mean, your destiny in Christ, at any point you can walk away from it. You see, Jesus Christ, he is the door. And his door, he offers provision. In his door, he offers this abundance. In, his, in this door, like, he offers this abundant life in the kingdom. In this door, he offers freedom. This door, who is Jesus Christ, offers as well this life of fulfillment and freedom and salvation. And so, you see, this door offers what we need. And so we see that um, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, like, I am the door. And we find ourselves then in John chapter 10. But in order to understand this chapter and what's taking place, it's important that we go back to chapter 9 to understand the context. And what happens in John chapter 9, the scripture says that Jesus, he heals a blind man. He is in the scene and he heals this blind man and his disciples are surrounding him. And then the disciple ask him, Rabbi, Rabbi. Like, who did commit the sin? Like, was it his parents or was it, or was it him that committed a sin? Because this man was blind from birth. That's what the scripture says. But if we think for a moment, like, who will assume, you know, that a blind man did something wrong? And that's the reason why they are, you know, he's blind, right? Seems to me some, like that it's a little bit insensitive. But the truth is that we cannot judge the disciples because sometimes we have this tendency that we judge or talk about people and we see people going through struggles and challenges and we say, well, probably, you know, this person, he must have done something in order to cause that to come to him. Like he probably did something that made that become, you know, his reality. And we forgot or we forget that God's face it's a face of grace and a face of mercy. That in God, we find this grace, we find this mercy that we need. And so he was at this point, Jesus, and he was, I mean, he healed this, this man. And what happens is, um, as he heals this man, well, back in the days, there was this correlation between, like, um, infirmity and sinfulness. And so Jesus, you know, there was a portion of theology back in the days, and people used to believe this. And even nowadays as well, there's some people that think like this way. Like there was this uh, correlation between infirmity and, and, and sinfulness. And so Jesus, he came to earth to restructure our theology, and he came to restructure our belief system. And so it could be that sometimes we can experience a bad day at work, and we ask God, like, what did I do in order for this to happen to me? What did I do so that, you know, I have such a bad day? But instead of asking him, what did I do? We should ask him, like, what do you want to do through this impossible situation? Because I know that you want to glorify yourself. I know that you want to do something to exalt your name through what I am going through. Things don't happen to me, that they, but they happen for me, and they're for a purpose. And we see that Jesus then, he's at this point, and he didn't respond the way the people expected. Because he didn't say, like, this is an issue of sin. It's because of sin. But instead, Jesus, he had a greater purpose, and he had a plan. Jesus, what he does then is, the scripture says, that he grabs 
a little bit of, uh, he grabs some dirt. Jesus, he grabs some dirt. And what he does, he says that he grabs some dirt. And then after he grabs dirt, this is what he does. He spit on it. He does this. Don't worry, I'm not spitting for real. <laughs> I know you're looking at me gross, right? <laughs> That's fine. But this is what Jesus did. Now imagine it's clean, no worries. Imagine, I mean, it sounds gross. But how many of you know that in order to make mud with dirt and saliva, you, you not only need a little bit of saliva. Like you need to, you know, you need to really need to spit like, like you mean it, right? <laughs> and so Jesus, it says that he grabs dirt and he spit on it and he makes mud and then he puts it on the blind man. Now, it might sound gross for us, but this is what Jesus was doing. He did this. You see, the point is that it doesn't have to make sense for us, it doesn't have to make sense to us for it to work, but we just have to believe and receive. I mean, he was not healing someone in a conventional way. That was not a conventional method to heal someone. Maybe you tell, you, maybe you ask me or maybe you tell me, well, Rudy, my arm is injured. Can you help me? I will say, okay, think if they would, I mean, imagine. And you, I tell you, okay. I'm going to help you out. Let me get some dirt, and then I'm just going to spit on it. I'm just going to spit on it, and everything will be fine. More likely, you're going to be grossed out, right? Like, it's going to gross you out. More likely, I will feel the same way because, I mean, who will, you know, it's, I'm not used to that, right? But this is what Jesus, what Jesus did. It says that he grabs this, puts it on his eyes. And after, not only he does that, but he asks him, go and wash yourself into the pool. Go clean yourself. Like if it was not enough already, what he was telling him to do, what he has done to put that mud. But he asked him, go and clean yourself. I mean, wouldn't Jesus be able to just heal him by touching his eyes or commanding his eyes to be open? Yeah, of course. But why does he ask him to then not only do this, but then go wash himself? Because you see, if you want to see a God miracle in your life, then you still need to use your faith. If you want to see God to do something so supernatural in your life, you still need to use your faith. And Jesus, what he was doing was he was creating a space for him to use his faith. Because you see, faith is manifested through obedience. And so he was giving him room to step out in faith. Sometimes we think that faith is only praying for the sick or prophesying over people. Don't get me wrong, keep doing that. And that's part of faith. But it seems to me that sometimes like we tend to skip that faith. It starts with, you know, being obedient in the smallest and in the things that seem to be insignificant. And so he gave him room, give, give him room to go and you know, step out in faith and go wash himself. And so obviously it says in the scripture that this guy was healed. This guy was able to see and then they take this guy to the Pharisees. And people are going crazy because he was able to see. This was the first time that Jesus was performing a miracle or the first time that he was recorded. And so people are going crazy. But then the Pharisees were upset. They were really upset and angry at this man. Because this man was saying that Jesus such and such healed me. And so the Pharisees were so upset that they basically removed, rejected this guy from the community. They were upset at him and at Jesus not only because he healed him, but as well because Jesus healed him during the Sabbath, even worse. And so they were furious. But one day supposed to be happy one, don't they supposed to be celebrating that this guy is able to see now that Jesus performed a miracle and he was blind from birth and now he can see and experience this wonderful miracle? Of course, they're supposed to be happy. But this is what the religious spirit does, that it distracts you from the real thing. 
what the religious spirit does is that actually it robs you from God's blessing. So we get to chapter 10. And Jesus, he's sharing with the Pharisees. And he tells the Pharisees. He's explaining, telling them in chapter 10, a parable of the good shepherd. And he's using, I mean, telling them this parable. And actually the word shepherd in the scripture is used over 400, 400 times. And so he's explaining this, sorry, 500 times. And he's telling them, explaining them the difference between good leadership and bad leadership. Basically, he was telling them, like, I'm good leadership and you guys, you know, it's bad leadership. And so he was explaining this to them. And back in the days, shepherds, what they will do is that they used to build these sheepfolds. And these sheepfolds was for the purpose of bringing all the sheep into the sheepfold so they could be protected by them. And it says that every sheepfold will have a narrow door. The purpose of a narrow door was that the sheep will go in and will go out. And the shepherd was able to count each sheep one by one. And so this was a narrow door and every sheepfold has this narrow door. I mean, do you remember, does it remind you when Jesus said in the scripture that the path to abundant life is only through a narrow door. And so every sheepfold has this narrow door. So the shepherd, he knows his flock, but not only he knows the flock, but as well, he knows each of the sheep because they know them, he knows them personally. And so Jesus was telling them when he was explaining this parable, he's telling them, if there's anyone that comes to the sheep and they don't go through the door, this person is a thief. And he was telling them, this thief is the Pharisees. And so we find ourselves at this point in John chapter 10, and he's explaining this parable. And he tells them that, he tells them, I am the door. And I am the door of the sheep fall. I am the door of the sheep. And so Jesus Christ, who is the door, it says, or we find that Jesus as the door, in him we have access to different things. And number one, the first thing I want to share with you is that the sheep, uh, sorry, that the door, who is Jesus Christ, the first thing that we find in him is that he provides protection. In verse 9, we see that it says, whoever goes through the door will be saved. In this, um, this word, save, in the book of Ephesians says that we were once death because of our transgressions, transgressions until he came and saved us. And so we needed a savior and he came to save us. And so sometimes people think that sin makes you bad people, but sin actually makes you dead people. So we needed a savior. And so maybe it could be that we're struggling with sin. But the truth is that Jesus, he can set us free. And so he provides this and as well he provides salvation. But Jesus, who is the door, not only provides salvation, the kind of, he not only provides protection, the kind of salvation for next life, but as well he provides protection for his children, for you and I right now. He provides protection for all of us. Maybe you, maybe you say, well, Rudy, I've been working hard I've been attending to church and it seems like, you know, like why does all these things and challenges like happen to me? Like it seems to me that the more I connect to church, that the more I am, you know, committed to church and serving, the more challenges I face on my way, the more challenges come on my way. And I will say to you, welcome to the family. But don't get disappointed because See what Jesus says in Exodus 23, verse 20. See, I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. Can you repeat after me? He is my protection. We shouldn't be disappointed because he is our protection. He will send an angel to protect us. He's always protecting us. And he's going to protect you and he's going to guard you as you walk in the journey that you're supposed to be walking. And so what has God called you to do? Like has he called you to start a new business? Or has he called you to join a life group? 
the good news is that as you decide to walk in the journey that God has called you to walk, then he will send his protection and he will guard you. Not as you are sitting down without doing anything. You see, often when we start walking in the journey that God called us to walk, that's often when the challenges come. And maybe it could be that you hear from God that you need to start a business or that you need to start something new and you hear from God and you're about to start that and when you're about to start that like you receive a call with telling you bad news or it could be that as soon as you were about to start then you get into an argument with your spouse or you get into an argument with your partner and there there are some setbacks and so it seems like something it's going on right my mother-in-law last week she was sharing with us and she was saying that like a couple of months they went through a season her and her church that they experienced probably the most difficult moments for them as a church and they, she was saying that as the challenge came like they were doing everything fine like they were being faithful there was nothing wrong they were doing like they were working on it and the challenge came but you see it's in those moments that the enemy will try to come and try to distract you. It's in those moments that he will come and try to tempt you to see if you quit. But if you remain faithful, if you remain walking in what God has called you to walk, if you continue in that journey, let me tell you, he will be faithful as well. Because he doesn't lie. Sometimes we think, well, I don't feel like God is protecting me. It doesn't seem like he's protecting me, but it is until I continue walking this journey as I continue to move forward. And then I look back that I realize, oh, he was definitely protecting me because I would have been dead if he wasn't with me, if he wasn't for him. Like you go look back and you say, well, it was him because if it wasn't for him, I would have lost everything. And so you realize that God is protecting you. He is protecting you and I. If you remember in the Old Testament, there was a story, the story of Moses. And it says in the story of Moses that Moses, I mean, God told Moses, Moses, go lead the people. He told them, go lead them. And Moses' response was like, wait, 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 God, like, wait a second. <laughs> like, I'm not capable of doing this. I, am, I don't have what it takes to do this. But it was until Moses was obedient that God sent him support, that he sent him Aaron. You see, God cannot send his assistance until you start obeying, until you step out in faith, until you start walking the journey that God has called you to walk, then he will send his support for you. We see in the scripture then that it says, who is the door like who is the door of this ship for this door is jesus christ the good news is that this ship for the door who is on the as who is at the entry point is jesus christ he is protecting us and so number one he provides protection for you and i yesterday i was i was at home taking care of 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 zion and i was like just reading and finish preparing and I was on my desk and my desk we have a, a, next to my desk we have a, 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 a bed it's on the guest room and I was trying to finish something and I was trying to take care of him at the same time and I was trying to do both and I said I'm not multitasker so that didn't go very well but I was trying to do both things and for a moment he was on the bed and he is starting to move a lot, like he can't stay still now. <laughs> so I was trying to just, you know, like with an eye, just look at him and try to do it like, like that, but he wasn't really working. And for a moment, as I was just typing something and I look back, he gets to the, you know, like the corner of the bed. And in a split of a second, like he's going down. Like, I'm like, I felt like I was having a heart attack <laughs> in that moment. And I don't know how, but I just moved my feet like this. You know, <laughs> you know my two feet, because I was on the chair. And he was able to land on my feet by the grace of God. 
And then my reaction was like, it's okay, you know, it's, it's fine, it's fine, you know. But inside of me, I was feeling like a heart attack, right? But I just didn't want him to cry. But you see, if that is my heart for my son, that I know, I mean, I barely have things or ways that I can protect him. How much more our Heavenly Father, who has everything, who loves you and he doesn't change. He's always protecting you. The scripture says that the one that protects you, he doesn't sleep. All of us, we sleep, but he doesn't sleep taking care of you, protecting you. So not only he protects you, but as well, he provides for your needs. In the same verse, verse 9, he says, whoever goes through the door will find pastures. These word pastures basically means that he will give you provision. And it's beautiful what he says in the scripture because it says that you will go in and you will go out and you will find pastures. You will go in and you will go out and you will find provision for your needs, for what you need. And I want to read to you, it says Philippians 4.19. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He will meet all your needs. When we become his children, he provides for what we need. He provides for you and I. He is our provider. Sometimes we think that, you know, people have misconceptions and think that when we become believers, we will stop having needs. But the truth is that we still have needs and we will still have, you know, different needs. But the difference is that we have somebody that now provides for our needs. So just because you're a believer doesn't mean that you will stop having needs. And it's not like you will have, you know, like you won't have that feeling like that there is not enough. You will still have sometimes these feelings. But let me tell you the good news is that he knows you before time. The shepherd knows his sheep. He knows them personally and individually. He knows you by name. And so he will provide. And so just because we are believers, we will still have needs. Like we, will, we still have the need of being acknowledged. We still have the need of being, you know, accepted. We still have the need of being loved. And so just because we are believers doesn't mean that, you know, we will stop having needs. We will still have needs. And sometimes people have the tendency that we start, you know, accusing the, the, the behavior without really understanding the need. And I've done that before, starting with my family. And God has spoke to me. It's like, what are you doing that? Why are you, you know, like doing this with, with your family? What are, what are you trying to do? Are you really loving on them? Are you really understanding them? Is that really the issue? God created all of us with different needs. So the problem is not that you're trying to meet the wrong need. But the problem is that you're trying to meet a need with the wrong method. In the wrong way. And so it could be that you have a struggle or a challenge with an addiction. You see, the problem is not the need but the problem is that you're trying to meet a need with the wrong method in the wrong way i have family members that have been able to overcome different addictions often the problem is that we're trying to meet a need in the wrong way with the wrong method often the problem is that you see the problem with our problems is that we don't even understand where the problem really is and so you see this is true as well with overspending this is true as well with over talking this is as well true with oversharing especially in social media and so this is true as well it could be that you have a deep need of connection and you feel lonely and you need to connect but if you don't treat this need 
like if you actually just put that on the side like it can turn into something bigger because you feel lonely it can turn into something much bigger something like like lost as like even like lost and the problem is that you will try to fill a hole in your hand with something that will leave you even worse but the good news is that it says that our creator jesus christ he will provide for all of our needs not according to our resources but according to his riches in glory not according to our strength but according to him he will provide for our needs the question is like are you willing to surrender the ways you think your needs are met and allow God to meet those needs if we think that if we think this is what I need and only this can meet my need then how are we gonna allow God supply for what we really need Jesus says that he will provide for our needs so Jesus is telling us that he who is the door he will provide protection he will provide for our needs and so he's telling us like I will lead you and provide protection and I will provide this for your needs and then it says at the end of this verse that there is a thief in verse 9 that there is a thief that comes to you see to steal kill and destroy so he tells us I'm gonna provide you I'm gonna lead you I'm gonna protect you and then he gives us an advice but there is a thief that is coming and this thief comes to steal kill and destroy and so it's kind of like he's giving us a heads up he's telling us you see like you gotta you see like the thief is gonna come so it's not a matter of if he comes it's a matter of of when he comes are you prepared like are you gonna be prepared because when he comes he's not gonna come try to be your friend when he comes he says that he comes to uh, steal kill and destroy and so number three Jesus he brings life but the thief comes to bring death and so he tells us are you prepared Jesus is saying and he's giving us a heads up are you prepared are you wise are you ready be aware don't forget about this that there's a thief and yes God is our protector he provides protection for us but how many of you know that like you could live in a beautiful house and this house could have for example you know a security system you might have cameras outside to see who's walking out in the gate by the gate you can have like as well weapons inside your house that happens in Guatemala quite often <laughs> like you can have any kind of machine gun inside your house or a grenade you can have a security system in case somebody tries to break in but how many of you know that if you if if you go and then you voluntarily go and open the door at midnight and the thief is standing right there guess what's gonna happen more likely he will try to sneak in right he will try to just go in because we voluntarily open the door for him and so Jesus he's giving us a heads up and he's telling us be aware the truth is that you see Jesus he can save us from our sin but he cannot save us from our stupidity <laughs> from the mistakes that we you know things that we do that's why he tells us be alert be wise so how can we be wise so that the enemy doesn't come and steal from us we're gonna end up soon and I'll just ask us if we can all stand up in order for you to be wise and close and you know and don't let the enemy steal from you you gotta close unnecessary doors doors in your life 
so that you won't let the enemy sneak in I mean what would you do if you know that he's going around there like he's you know trying just to sneak in and he's trying just to threaten like what would you do you see when you know that he's out there and you know that he's can try to sneak in then you know that there's no time for you to you know be involved in conflict like you know there's no time for you to be involved in conflict with your brothers and sisters with your brother and sister in church because they're your family you need them when you know that he's out there you know just going around and trying to threaten you know that there's no time for you to doubt your brother's intentions and make assumptions about your brother and sister instead you go and talk to them directly in, in love to try to solve it because you need your brother and sister when you know that he's out there there's no time for you to you know like to be fighting fights that you shouldn't be fighting instead your focus and you know that there's some battles that you need to fight and some that you don't when you know that he's out there there's no time for you to get offended easily because you know that somebody is out there and you need your brother and sister when you know that he's out there there's no time for you to keep grudges to yourself or like hold on to offenses because you know that there's an enemy out there and he's not your brother and sister your brother and sister is your family and you need them to keep moving forward so we gotta close unnecessary doors to live a wise life as well today I want to invite all of us as we are closing just to lift up our voices and we're gonna worship God Jesus who is the door I believe and we want to declare that he provides protection he provides for all of our needs he's the one who's leading good leading us and guiding us amen so I want to ask the, the worship team to lead us in worship and let's lift up our voices and declare that before I spoke a word you were singing up for me been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me spirit that you're in this place what doors are we gonna choose to go through and what doors are we wanna are we going to decide to walk past you see it's still our decision God offers different things for us and we just need to decide and go through the door who is him he is protecting us he's guiding us leading us and he provides for our needs good thing is if for some of us we had to make decisions that maybe are not easy you see our God our Jesus he is the one that leads us he leads the way the Good Shepherd it says there's the kind of shepherds that stay behind the flock as the sheep walk but Jesus our Savior it says that he walks in front of us leading us ahead that he's guiding you 
He is showing the way. And He has done it before you. And He protects you as well as He leads you. Today I just want to ask you to place your hand in your heart. And just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me today? Spirit, I just pray this afternoon that you touch our hearts, touch our lives. We know that as we step into the door, who is Jesus, that there is a Zoe life in you. There is a life that cannot be quantified because you're too big. We want to remain in you thank you that you are a protector that you provide for our needs that in the midst of what's going on love has overcome we thank you Jesus and I pray for all of us here today as we step out from this place may your face shine upon us and keep us safe I bless all of us here today thank you because we are covered by your blood by the blood of Jesus the enemy cannot come against us as we walk with you as you protect us and as we live a life in wisdom we thank you in your name we pray amen 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 <laughs>